Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. Uh, my name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for U of I Extension, and I'm based here in central Illinois. And our topic today is all things trees, and in particular, we're going to be talking about uh, tree and shrub kind of plant selection and a little bit about planting, because this time of year is a great time to be thinking about that. So if you have questions about tree planting, tree selection, anything tree related or any other gardening question, feel free to start adding those into the comment box and we'll get to those today. Uh, so as we're introducing ourselves today, we're also gonna talk about some of our favorite trees and shrubs and we're gonna, Ryan's gonna touch on some really great ones today to show you a little bit more. Um, but I wanted to start off with beautyberry. So American beautyberry, the calicarpa, uh, Americana, love beautyberry as a shrub. So if you need a, a native shrub to put in a spot, not too big, it probably gets about three, five feet or so, I would say on average. So you, you don't need a ton of space for it. But the best feature of it is this time of year, there are bright purple uh, berries on it. Like nothing else you have in the landscape, just these vibrant purple um, of berries on there. And it's just beautiful. So I love it in the landscape for that color. I will cut it and use it in arrangements for that color. And it's just a really low maintenance, native, drought tolerant, tough shrub with some great fall uh, ornamental appeal. So that's mine. So Kelly, you want to introduce yourself and tell us what one of your favorites is? Um, yeah, my name is Kelly Alsip and I am a horticulture educator based out of Bloomington. Um, my specialty is integrated pest management. Um, and then I, um, I feel like I'm somewhat a jack of all trades because I know a little bit about this, a little bit about this, but I love vegetable gardening. That's one of the things I do at my home. And um, I agree with Candace. I think beautyberry is one of the most stunning um, shrubs for fall interest that you can plant in your garden. Um, but, uh, you know, going with that whole fall theme, I am passionate about um, uh, bald cypress mm -hmm. and um, it has the, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's called a deciduous conifer. So it loses its needles every year, but before it loses them, they kind of have this kind of cinnamon brown kind of feel. And then they have these uh, round cones that kind of turn more blue as the season progresses. And I love the way it buttresses at the bottom. And I just think it's a really, really cool adaptive tree. And I'm starting to see people use it a lot in the, um, you know, at uh, parks and uh, alongside roadways. And uh, just a really cool tree. I think it tends to be uh, a lot of horticulturist favorites. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the round cones or maybe it's the adaptability of the tree that makes it easy to grow everywhere any, in most places. But it's a very large tree. So you're not going to put it in my backyard. You might put it in Ryan and Candace's backyard and be very successful with it. But mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure Ryan and Candace love that tree too. Oh yeah. It's a cool one. Yeah, to totally agree. I absolutely love that plant. It's one of my favorite shade trees to recommend to people. And it's for that toughness. Like, I don't know that I've planted a bald cypress that's died other than in a restoration setting where lots of trees sometimes die or don't make it. But, um, but yeah, like any, any bald cypress I've ever planted, I've had awesome luck with. They grow relatively fast, beautiful fall color. Just, man, I could go, we could spend the whole topic, the whole show today on bald cypress. <laughs> but yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Ryan Pancall, horticulture educator in Champaign. And um, like Kelly, I am an amateur gar vegetable gardener at home. I grow a lot of vegetables. That's one of the things I like to do, but trees and shrubs and everything woody plants is just my favorite uh, subject area of horticulture. So this is one of my favorite topics to cover in the show today. And so um, I, I'll talk about, so Candace, you mentioned a shrub. Kelly, you mentioned a full-size tree. I'll talk about something in between is kind of one of my favorites. Uh, that serviceberry is just a, a 
wonderful native uh, small tree slash shrub. I mean, it's kind of somewhere in between. Um, I love it because it can have a very clumpy habit or from, you know, from day one, if you prune it correctly, you can make it be a little more tree-like. Um, for me, I just have fond memories of this plant from the early days of exploring Southern Illinois and all the natural areas down there. There's just a ton of resources down there. If you hadn't made it, made it all the way down to the Southern portion of our state, get down there because it is beautiful. Um, and so what, what I always remember Serviceberry from is the early days of exploring cliff tops of Southern Illinois and it kind of coexists up in that clifftop ecosystem with, you know, post oak and blackjack oak and a bunch of lichen and moss and all those things. And first thing in spring, it would have a beautiful flower display. It would be one of those first, you know, white flowers all over the cliff tops is what I kind of remember that plant. But what's awesome about it this time of year is it has just a spectacular fall color most times. In most sites, a healthy service berry is going to have really beautiful color. And as the name implies, it has berries that provide some uh, winter forage for birds. So going into, so this is really the time of year I feel like it shines is fall color going into winter. It had retained some berries, kind of like um, a lot of other plants that have beautiful, you know, berries in the wintertime. And then to top it off, it has really smooth, interesting bark, kind of like a beach. And so I like, I, uh, you know, I've, I guess I've spent maybe a little too much time staring at bark in my days, but <laughs> like plants that have like interesting bark because a lot of, you know, if any of you all have looked at bark over the years, you, a lot of it kind of looks the same. So when something kind of sticks out bark wise, that's usually a plant that, that I kind of like, but um, well, so I have some PowerPoint slides prepared here that I was going to show that has some information about uh, some of the plants we'd like to talk about today. Now, these are all Illinois native plants that I'm here. So Okay. Ryan, let me make a comment. I remember sure. when I first learned about service berry, it was across from Plant Science Building. Candace, do you remember that? Yeah, I know what you're talking they about. They had some plantings out there, and I used to sneak out there and eat the berries because the berries <laughs> are delicious. And it used to feel like it was my own little secret. Like nobody else really knew that you could eat the berries. And so it was like my personal little snack. <laughs> of course, I had to compete with the with the uh, uh, birds. But yeah. uh, I and I do want to say one of the great you bring up a great point, uh, Ryan. You know, when you're thinking about planting trees, think about the bark. Think about the fall color and the spring bloom and the easiness of growing it and if it's a fast grower or a slow grower. So the fact that you're looking at the bark, um, I think that's a really good way to look at trees to go, is this interesting all throughout the year? Yeah, I mean, as a forester in previous jobs, I've spent a lot of time wandering around the woods in wintertime looking for something interesting out of those tree trunks, you know, and so that's maybe how some of these plants tend to stick out to me. But, uh, well, so to, to kind of get, get into some of the information we'll present today on specific plants, again, all these are Illinois natives. We're going to kind of start with some uh, smaller shrubs, and we'll move to middle-sized trees and then shade trees at the end if we can get to it. Um, if you guys have questions, throw them in, in as, as we're talking about this. But um, each one of these slides is kind of organized similarly, where at the top you can see that uh, shrubby St. John's work takes full sun to part shade. The medium uh, represents um, the soil conditions that it most likes, uh, soil moisture. So medium soil moisture for this plant. Um, I really like this one, uh, not for its winter character in this case, but for its flowering. And it really flowers for just I mean, a huge chunk of time throughout the growing season and has pollinator favorite in places I've seen it planted uh, and stays relatively small. So that's one of the benefits of this plant. So um, do either of you ladies have any particular experience with shrubby St. John's wort or anything to comment on or favorite attributes of it? I I've always wanted, wanted to get one planted. I just haven't gotten it done yet because I love it. I use it, I order it a lot as a cut flower, hypericular yeah. berry. So I need to add some to my landscape. Yeah. yeah I have so it in my landscape and um, I actually cut it back and I wish I hadn't because it was getting, it was, I put it in the wrong layer of landscape. Um, so it, I put it on the edge and it needed to be in the middle. Um, but I, I think it is amazing. The foliage is beautiful, but I wish I would have, you know, seen the seed capsules, but probably not the most ornamental. 
Yeah, so I mean, it comes from kind of the world of prairie ecosystems. So it's not one that I think of in a forest. Um, and so actually with this plant, and there's a few others that are kind of the woody, prairie shrubby species, like uh, they can be managed in the landscape by being cut to the ground like that if you want to keep them smaller. Now, New Jersey tea is one of those that I've planted, kind of done that with, kept it cut back every couple of years or every year, just to keep it as a shorter shrub and maintain a smaller size. And you know, that mimics um, that fire regime in the prairie where those above ground parts would have been burned up by a fire every periodically. So that plant has enough energy root reserve, enough, enough energy in their roots that they can handle that kind of management. So that's another like kind of benefit to shrubby St. John's wort. Uh, New Jersey tea is another one that kind of works that way. Um, lead plant is another one that's really, really pretty prairie species that all of those would be kind of a full sun setting. I don't think I've ever really planted uh, St. John's wort in shade at all. So although it does say on the slide that it is, and you can read that it is, I've, I've never personally planted it in any kind of shade uh, setting. Um, well, so let's move on to our next uh, plant, which is one of my old favorites, button bush. We've talked about this on the show before. And I guess one of the biggest benefits that I, I like of this plant is its tolerance of wet habitats and of poorly drained soil. That's one of the things it can handle is those wetter spots. Uh, and probably as just its biggest benefit, coolest thing it's got to offer are those awesome spiky balls that are the flowers. Uh, not a lot of other things like that. Um, so um, anyway, beautiful shrub. Uh, but I guess one thing about it is that it does, it, do, it is fairly large. If you look at its size, it gets pretty big and it can kind of take over a spot. So that's something to remember about this one, that it takes some space. Uh, but great wildlife value if you look at everything from you know, the birds actually eating the quote unquote buttons for the fruits in the wintertime to, uh, you know, nectar for pollinators and things. And, and there's some leaf feeding insects and other insects that use the plant in other ways. So uh, really a great wildlife value for this plant as well. But um, yeah, I love the ball, the balls, the ball like fruits on that one. That's so, those are so cool. Yeah, but definitely a full sun plant. It, it doesn't handle shade very well. Um, I kind of have it planted at our house in a Semi, you know, part sun, part shade location. I think it's kind of slow growing there and um, not, but it, but it was a wet spot. So that's why it got planted there at my house was to handle that kind of problem wet area along the road and ditch in our front yard. So, yeah, I'd like to put one in. I just haven't found the perfect spot for something that's going to get that big. So I got to pump. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have a little space, but um, nice native. Um, there are a number of native Vars out there, this one that I've seen. I, I haven't personally planted a native R of it, but you that wh what that does is makes it sometimes a little easier to find because um, yeah, some of these natives are difficult to find. So let me let me flip our slide to the next one. Uh, so this is Eastern Wahoo, which is an interesting little shrub that you know, I knew for years out in out in the forest, I'd always see Wahoo in the understory and say, oh, there's Wahoo. What a, what a fun name to say. What a just kind of cool plant. Look at its interesting fruit capsule. But where it kind of falls into play for me nowadays is that it's a wonderful replacement for burning bush, which is one of those plants that we've now learned is invasive. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about this in the show before. That was just a heartbreaking moment for me to learn that burning bush is invasive and I can't plant it anymore. So I mean, since I learned that maybe over a decade ago, um, I've been always in search of that perfect replacement plant where I don't know that Wahoo's perfect. It's actually kind of a, gets to be almost a small tree at, in, in maturity. So a little larger, so, but, but it can handle shade. So that's one of the things that I loved about burning bushes from full sun to shade, it can handle all those spots. And Wahoo has that really beautiful uh, fall color that burning bush has. If you notice, they're the same genus. Uh, burning bush in uh, Wahoo. So I found it to be a good replacement, but you know, one thing that um, folks, as I've started to talk about this plant more in, in presentations and as a recommendation, because for me, it's something from nature I now have seen cultivated. And so that's, I've seen it in enough places planted and go, doing well in an urban environment. It's convinced me this is a good urban plant, uh, yet still hard to find at nursery. So how do you find these is kind of a question we, we all get a lot. And you know, I, I think there's there's a number of different things you can do to find these. I think the first step for everyone, though, should be to kind of reach out to your local nursery and ask if they have this plant, because um, our, our local nurseries may not know that we want these kind of natives. So it's important to kind of, you know, drive the demand or drive some of their ordering 
with this. They may be able to order it. Um, and if not, uh, you know, some of the places I found this plant is online. There's, there's great places you can order from online uh, that will ship these plants to you, either bare root or in a small pot. I've, I've purchased this as a one gallon pot in the past that got shipped right to my front door. And, you know, while it's great to keep our business local, I'd love to see this in our local nurseries. Um, that's maybe a place to source some of this difficult to find stuff. But I think the one thing I always want folks to remember when you start to look at online sources is you probably need to talk with this nursery and be sure that from a geographic standpoint, the genes in that plant are going to work in your area of the country. So you really don't want to buy this from a nursery out in, you know, out on the East Coast somewhere where they could be almost in a different climatic zone. They may have seed collected with a different, you know, set of genetics than the seed that we would collect around the Midwest. So that's kind of my caution in, in trying to find this in a, um, in an online nursery is just to, to call and ask. A lot of these places that grow natives, they know very well where their seed source came from and they can help you sort through that whether their plant would be a good a good fit for your area or not. So that's, uh, but anyway. Nice. Enough about Wahoo, unless, ladies, do you have anything to add? Any things that you love about Wahoo? <laughs> I, I love Wahoo. I just, I discovered it initially. I was doing a kind of a prairie woodland walk with a group of master gardeners for master gardener training one season and we came across it and I wasn't familiar with it yet so I was like what is this odd looking capsule <laughs> it's such a cool uh, plant and then I was luckily enough to find one at a garden center probably about two years ago so I have a small one going in my landscape now and I love it yeah it's great yeah really cool plant great for underneath the shade tree that shade garden type setting uh, that's where mine is it's right yeah. on that kind of the edge of my uh, shade garden yeah Okay. I just wanted to reiterate. I'm, I just wanted to reiter, reiterate one point that Ryan made. I mean, be, coming from I was in the greenhouse industry before I took this job in extension, and they need to hear what kinds of plants that you want. Even mm -hmm. if you know you're going to call and they're going to say no, we don't have that plant. They need to hear that. We need to hear that. You know, if one or two people call and say, hey, we want Eastern Wahoo, I'm probably going to make sure that plant is available in the growing season. You know, even just one or two suggestions will guide what I order for the nursery or for the greenhouse. So I think it's really important to communicate with your uh, your favorite nursery or your favorite garden center. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. They, don't, they don't know. It's just a guessing game for what they're purchasing to or to grow. So yeah, it all helps. You know, and as someone that's like learned all these plants out in nature and studied them for years out in the environment, like I just love it to see Wahoo pop up in gardens, you know, like it's, it's been in the last five years I've seen it in, you know, four or five different places around uh, planted. It's like, Oh my gosh, that's Wahoo. It, you know, it does great in an urban setting too. So um, I just love, those are some of my favorite species of all time. The ones that, you know, now are, are in cultivation. So, I mean, we know because it's been sold other places, it's for sale, like it's possible to be produced in cultivation for sale. And um, some plants are so sensitive uh, to the environment or other things. It's just difficult for, you know, nurseries to have them in stock because they're difficult to cultivate. So, mm -hmm. all right. anyway, so I want to uh, hit a couple of questions before you go to the next one, Ryan. Um, so keep adding those questions to the comments and we'll get them as we go through a uh, question from earlier when I was talking about beautyberry, uh, someone asked the berries poisonous on the beautyberry. So I did a quick search. They are not, uh, poisonous though. It sounds like they are rather bitter. So they probably wouldn't be, so they would be edible in meaning they're not poisonous, but they would probably be not tasty. <laughs> in that. Palatable. Palatable. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and then let's see, Mike has a question about L. Mike, I'm going to come back to yours in a little bit. But Natalie uh, just realized as well that burning bush was invasive. Um, she has a hedge of mature burning bush that's a great barrier for her front yard. So now that she knows that that, that burning bush is not I ideal, what would you, would you have any good recommendations for swapping something out for a good barrier? Uh, for a front yard that wouldn't be invasive? Got any suggestions for? Sure. Well, I mean, we're we're going through a list of some right now. Yeah. I, you know, but I guess it depends on if it's sun, like sun or shade, since burning bush can kind of be in both. I'm going to kind of presume sun. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
you know, we've talked about, you know, uh, button bush is a great one that could replace that. I guess if it was too dry of a site, that it would probably be stressed. Um, you know, I guess one of the things I've yet to really find in a plant that burning bush offers is the great fall color it's got, um, interesting twigs in the winter time, and then it's just crazy prunability. You know, like that's one of those plants that you can prune in almost any shape. You can cut it to the ground and it'll grow back from the roots. Like I've just always loved the hand prunability of that plant for it to be whatever shape or size you kind of want. Um, and so I haven't found a great replacement that meets all those marks, you know, from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. But uh, what, let's see, what would, some, what's some, what would some other favorites of yours be that are uh, the shrub, same size shrub and fits about the same spot? You know what is... It may not grow as tall as burning bush, but what I have been noticing around my neighborhood is Virginia sweet spire. Mm -hmm. Just gorgeous fall color. Um, I mean, yes, I don't know if you can like prune it into a hedge. I'm sure you could do something, but uh, that's one of the ones that I always suggest as an alternative. Um, I like Aronia too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, viburnum, I know they don't, um, I know they're yeah. not, you know, that beautiful hedge, but. Yeah, I was going to say viburnum too, yeah. I think sweet spire would stay semi-compact. Would you agree, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think a thing I really love about sweet spire is it's so fragrant when it blooms in the, you know, June-ish maybe is when it blooms, kind of in that early part of summer. And I mean, if you've got a row of those, you smell them, in, you know, anywhere around. Um, so definitely tops my favorite, one of my favorites and really good fall color on that one as well. Yeah. Just beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful plant. Beautiful. Yeah. And you know what I would do too, is if, if it doesn't need to be kind of pruned into a hedge, if you're just looking for like a row of plants, I would do like a panicle hydrangea all day too. Like a little limelight or one of the smaller ones that would be killer for me. Yeah. And, and the, back to the, the natives, um, nine bark is a really great, mm -hmm. I like for a lot, like a row like that, kind of like a shrub. Row. Yeah. And yeah. It's a nice kind of cascading, you know, flower, white flower display early in the year. And um, what one thing I kind of like about it too, is that even though it's deciduous and loses its leaves, it's kind of so branchy sometimes in there that it's still kind of provide some of that visual block even without leaves because it those they tend to get kind of thick at least the ones at my house are real thick yeah okay awesome well let's go ahead and talk about mike's question and then we can kind of go back to some of these ryan um mike asked a recommendation on planting an elm tree how much room do they need how tall do they get and how wide will the canopy go so he wants to make he wants to make sure it stays away from his neighbor's property Sure. Well, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing with elm trees to talk about is Dutch elm disease. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a, a disease we brought here that wiped them out back in the 50s through the 70s or so. Um, so just about any American elm tree that you buy to these days is a resistant variety to that disease. And a lot of them are crossbred with other elms. Or there's, there's a lot of different ways we've come up with some resistant elms. So that would be the first like major point to think about when planting an elm is you don't want anything that's susceptible to that disease. And I, I doubt you'd be able to really find one for sale at a nursery, but if you just dig up an elm from somewhere, you're not going to have any of that disease resistance. And it's almost inevitable that that plant will succumb to Dutch elm disease at some point in its life. So that's probably the big first biggest recommendation there, but man, it, as far as an urban tree goes, elms are pretty awesome ones, uh, just because they have such an adaptable root system, they handle action well. I mean, at the time Dutch elm disease hit, they were just a giant percentage of our urban forest canopy around the country because they are such a great urban tree. So, um, so they really handle probably the whole gamut from dry soils to wet compacted soils, like they're, they're pretty adaptable. So I think what my best recommendation would be to, is to select, you know, it's probably going to do best in a full sun site, although they can handle a little bit of shade, they do have some shade tolerance, probably going to do best in a full sun site. And I would select one of those um, cultivars that's resistant to Dutch elm disease. I know there's been a couple, I think, developed by Morton Arboretum up in Lyle, Illinois. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of them out there that have been, uh, you know, kind of tested over the years. So I'd try and find not, maybe not a newer one, but one that's had a little bit of time 
to show its use in the landscape. And I'm I'm sorry, I can't think of heritage is one of the one one of the cultivars I know I've seen planted around Champaign Urbana. I can't think of some of the others. So you'd have to do a little research to find those, but I think you could find them pretty quick. Um, another thing I'll mention is there are some other elms that are resistant that are native. So uh, slippery elm is one that I've started to see actually in cultivation some. Um, that's one of those that I know from, from nature first. <laughs> Uh, and so it's maybe a little bit smaller of a tree, but has some similar adaptability, a um, little smaller in, ha in size and shape. But um, one of the things on the shape of elms, one of the things that you get that's really awesome with an elm tree is just that beautiful um, kind of V-shaped uh, structure. And so that's nice because you can have things underneath it and you don't have branches kind of hanging down over a roof or a sidewalk or a driveway. So you can Maybe with a little corrective pruning over the years, keep a nice V-shaped, you know, canopy that's high up in the air and uh, just as a wonderful, like, large shade tree along along a boulevard, um, even as a specimen in your backyard. But as a row, they make a nice planting as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Oh, I'm looking in my Forest Trees of Illinois book to see the size. So American elm can grow up to 100 feet tall. That's a uh, pretty large tree. I would say you need lots of space for that tree. Mm -hmm. And the slippery elm that um, Ryan was referring to um, is about, you know, 70 to 80 feet tall. So that's a medium to large. But when he's talking about cultivars, you might find some cultivars that stay a little bit smaller and that will be in their description. But, you know, as far as room, even though it grows that kind of V-shaped then kind of rounded habit, you probably need a bit of room for this tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, long, in the long term. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. Great points, Kelly. You, you need a lot of space for that. That's a large tree for sure. Um, well, do we have any questions, Candace, or should we? Yeah, let's do one, one more because there's something we just talked about. Matt asks, uh, would nine bark be a nice alternative to burning bush? I've seen a lot of cultivars of varying color mm -hmm. and size. And I think we all said, yep, absolutely. Yes. I have um, Diablo cultivar, and I'm trying to think the other cultivar I have. It's more of a orangey, reddish, greenish foliage. And both of them, yeah, are killer. Really great. Really so great. Is, is Diablo a little more purple? There's even Yeah, Diablo is that purplish foliage one. Mm-hmm. And plus, it's kind of more interesting than burning bush in the spring and the summer. Burning bush so. is kind of blah, except for the fall, personally, to me. Yeah. And nine bark so much more interesting. And it has cool, like, round flowers earlier in the season, too. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great shrub. Yeah. I do, too. For sure. Definitely. Good question. Okay, yeah, we've got an apple tree question, but I think let's come back to that if you want to um go through a couple more of these ryan sure and uh kelly started to mention this uh just a minute ago uh the viburnum species so there's mm -hmm. these natives uh black haw is one of those that i like because um it handles a lot of shade it can be a pretty uh shade loving plant has this beautiful fall color so you know as we're talking about replacements for burning bush this is one for a shady spot that would work wonderfully so um Definitely has value to, for our natives between the berries that it keeps over the winter time and pollen and nectar for insects in the, in the spring when it flowers. Um, it it kind of has all that and, and has a, a very good flower display in the spring and really kind of a, a long lasting flower display for mid spring two weeks. That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good flowering display for that time of year. So, um, you know, handles drought in, in urban soils well is one of the things that I like about about black haw as well. It's kind of one of those tougher, tougher plants on the list. But um, anything to add on black haw? Have you ladies planted it or enjoyed this, it? When it comes to, um, when I talk about, you know, gardening for birds, this is one you've got to add to your landscape because mm -hmm. it will attract those birds. Yeah. They want those, uh, those fruits. Yeah. I, I love black haw by Burnham. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Any, I'll take any of the viburnums, honestly, but yeah, this one in particular. <laughs> Me too. I'm I'm a viburnum fan. Yeah. Yeah, great plants for the landscape. And so, all right, moving on to an even more shade tolerant shrub. And it, ladies, I thought I took this one out of the slide. But Spice Bush stayed in. It's one. It's just one of my favorites. 
of all time for for JD Scott, and we've talked about this in the show before. Um, you know, really interesting little yellow flowers very early in the year, so it provides an early floral resource for our pollinating insects. Uh, so that's great, but um, does really well again in full shade. So great shade locate spot, great great plant for a shade spot. And why I love it from nature is that this is one of those plants that um, in a forest setting where we did have invasive species, we had things like. Uh, burning bush and bush honeysuckle and things taking over the understory that we didn't want. This is one of those plants that with removing some of the non-natives, this plant's able to kind of take over and fill the spot and compete and be on the right side in nature, a very competitive plant with some of those invasives. So that's what, you know, brought my love of it in the natural world. And now to see it as one of these plants that a lot of folks plant and is cultivated and is really just popping up more and more in, in, in garden centers, I love to see that. So... Anything else on uh, spice bush before we find well, get your spice bush t-shirts made then? <laughs> <laughs> it supports um, spice bush swallowtail. Yeah. Very important larva source for that beautiful butterfly. So uh, if you're a, a butterfly gardener, this is and this is something to add to your garden. I know that butterfly gardens usually we promote them being in full sun, that's because the butterflies need to absorb the, the sun to keep themselves warm. But the larva, they absolutely need this plant. And without this plant, they won't survive. So um, this can be a great addition to your garden and knowing that you're helping larva of native butterfly, spice bush swallowtail. Love it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for adding that, Kelly. I forgot about that particular relationship. So that's a, another one of those specific host plants. Um, all right, so moving on to kind of our small story or, I'm call, or small tree category or understory trees, uh, Washington hawthorn is one that I really like. And um, again, saw it quite a bit in nature. Um, it's It's been in cultivation for a good number of years, but uh, one of the greatest attributes it has, I think, is its berries that kind of persist in the winter and can really be a stunning display in the wintertime. Um, you know, birds birds and mammals sparingly eat the fruits. So there's a list of them that do, but it's not always their favorite. Uh, but it provides that some of that forage for, um, for birds in the wintertime. I guess the negative side of this plant is that it has thorns. So that's why I included a little picture of the thorns. They're big, they're obtrusive. Uh, you know, not a great plant to plant in your front yard for kids to climb on. You know, it's it doesn't meet the need for that all that well. But um, it also, beyond kind of its uh, fruiting display, um, it has flowers in the springtime, and it actually does have bark that I think is kind of interesting. It, it foli exfoliates a bit, so it peels off a bit and kind of provides some different colors of bark. So as this tree gets larger and mature, that trunk actually has some winter interest as well. Um, so anyway, um, have you guys ever planted a hawthorn or have any hawthorn stories to share? Or... No? I just thought it's more of an old-fashioned tree, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've never planted one, but I love, it's interesting to come across when you're out, out in the woodland to see all those thorns on there, yeah. Yeah, and so some pretty good fall color this time of year as well, and uh, definitely is one that takes a full sun site to get, you know, a full crop of berries every year and have that good fall display. It's going to need um, full sun in this case. So now let's pop to something that is uh, part sun or shade tolerant. So pawpaw, one of my favorite native uh, smaller trees and just really interesting tree with, you know, the largest native tree fruit in North America. So, you know, apples and oranges and things, those aren't from North America. Uh, pawpaws are largest native tree fruit. You can see a picture of those there. So a great one for um, developing like a kind of a colonial stand of plants there. So it's gonna spread from roots. It's gonna, it's not gonna be the kind of plant that always stays right in one spot and has a nice little specimen for you unless you control some of those suckers. So, you know, like where I've planted it is in the back corner of my yard where I have a, a woodland edge where my yard kind of meets the woods. I've started to set uh, um, a little patch of pawpaw. Uh, we've actually planted one here at our extension building, just right behind the wall behind me here. And the hope with those it, is to let those kind of turn into a little pawpaw patch of sorts and add in some other native shade loving plants as well to create kind of like a little shade garden on the north side of the building. So we're only capturing, you know, the, this is a one story building. We're only capturing the shade from that one story really to kind of plant this in. So it doesn't take a ton of space. Um, it can tolerate just almost full sun conditions with some of the different cultivars they have 
that are out these days that were kind of uh, developed with respect to fruit production. So uh, there's there's a, n- a number of different cultivars out there. I like to plant the straight species because I like its really good shade tolerance um, and just its its huge value for wildlife. A pretty good value for this. Um, everything from its you know early flowering, it's, it flowers super early, so it's early floral resource that it offers to all the insects that use it throughout the growing season for feeding on leaves or, t- or twigs or other things. So really nice small native tree that you could add in the shady setting. So Love that. that has a really good fall color. I mean, you say good yellow. I mean, this usually when I, it's the yellow fall color. When I see a pawpaw patch, I'm like, wow, look at those big, beautiful yellow leaves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the picture doesn't do it justice for how big the leaves are, you know, where leaves can be on a pawpaw pretty pretty long and they have kind of that pointy tip. It looks like, a, I mean, we've talked about this before, I think on the show, it, it's its genus originates in the tropics. And, you know, this is the furthest in the Asimina plants in the Asimina genus uh, extend. So it has some of those tropical attributes. I think it just is a really neat looking plant. If you've ever seen it nat- in, in nature as a patch, a pawpaw patch, it's, it's a cool cool appearance for the understory. So I guess the biggest thing to caution folks on in this is that it it doesn't like a super dry spot. So that's where you could probably get in trouble with pawpaws. If it was super duper dry, you may have to provide some watering. Um, It doesn't tolerate drought well in really dry spots. In nature, it usually grows in a really rich, moist soil. It's kind of the spot where it likes to be. So. Cool, love that one. Um, Next on the list is one that I kind of think falls between, you know, shrub and tree, kind of one of those plants, kind of like service berry, uh, where uh, witch hazel is kind of a, I guess we have it listed as an understory tree, definitely po- tolerates some shade, uh, probably a little better display of everything in the sun, but I really like this for its ornamental value because it has just a super interesting um you know, flower display about this time of year. And what other plant do we know of that, you know, blooms late in the season like this? So you can see really interesting yellow flowers there um, and a pretty good wildlife value because it's native. So uh, that's just, I think probably the main reason why this falls on one of my list of favorites is just because of that interesting, you know, flower display that has late in the season. Yeah, I love that too. And uh, I think as a pollinator person, like with the the spice bush, it provides those early nectar floral resources. This is one that provides some late nectar floral resources. And we know in pollinator garden, we really are trying to push people to think about those really early sources and those really late sources. Mm -hmm. And this would be a great plant to add. Yeah, that's a good point. Takes a little space. It does, you know, although height is 15 to 20 feet, spread is probably about the same on this. It kind of spreads out into a big wide shrub, but um, takes some space, but just a beautiful one if you can add it. Um, it's got that nice yellow fall color on the leaves and yellow flowers. So another great one. Um, and so we've kind of already ta- touched on service berry. Here's kind of some pictures to to prove what we we're what I was talking about earlier is true about the plant, but um, you know, a great, great fall color, great berries in the winter time, And there's that smooth bark that I think makes an awesome, you know, another awesome attribute for winter. Um, so you know, we've kind of already talked about this. Uh, it takes a little, takes a little space. It's probably 15 to 25 feet tall and probably about as wide at maturity. So they kind of spread out and get nice and wide. But you can see in the picture there, those are, uh, they're kind of clump forming plants. So I, I kind of like it as a clump like that, where I have seen places where Folks have pruned it to be more of a tree with a central leader and not so much, not so many stems. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to go outside and look at the bark of mine because I really, I don't know, I don't notice it that often. So I'm going to have to go pay attention to mine because I have one on the, as kind of the corner foundation planting of my house and it's, I love it. Yeah. But I never look at the bark. I'm going to have to pay it more attention. Yeah. And sometimes it's a smaller plant, maybe it's younger and it doesn't show up as well as when those get larger like these, it really kind of, yeah, it's cool. Yes. Very cool. Um, so this is one that I know, Kelly, you've covered as a favorite fall tree. And do you want to talk a little bit about your um, fall trees and shrubs guide? We, we yeah, kind of- I did a, a fall tree walk for Illinois Central College. And if you live in that area, the Horticulture Center has this wonderful collections of plants and uh, 
pretty much all these plants that Ryan has talked about is there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Candace has done workshops there on tree identification. Mm-hmm. Um, so Illinois Central College in East Peoria is just a wonderful place to go and look at trees. And I did a fall color walk there. And um, they have a, a black gum, which um, is probably the number one plant for fall color. Um, maybe, you know, even better than a uh, burning bush. And the reason is because the leaves are so shiny. Normally you see in that picture, you see the light reflecting off the leaves. And so then it just kind of makes that fall color more intense, which is why he has excellent exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Three exclamation points. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, the way Candace and I learned this tree, our Woody ornamental professor, this was his favorite tree. So, so you better that. learn this tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you it was going to show up on a test. So, yeah, this one's just amazing when it comes to the fall color. You like the fall color. This is one is it. You know, I have seen some oaks that do a pretty good job of fall color, but I don't know. Black gum just seems to be, you know, just outstanding. It's a little bit later than some of the other trees that when it comes to uh, coloring up for the fall, but that's just, that's my point. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's like just one of the best of our natives in fall color display. I mean, maybe sweet gums kind of up there with it as maybe a close second or tie for first. But with sweet gum, you have all those pesky gumballs. <laughs> yeah, I'd much rather have this. <laughs> yeah, tiny, tiny little berries that are great for birds is what it offers. So mm-hmm. this is another one of those that I, I saw in nature for years before I understood it was a good urban tree. So I, I love to see that and learn that. And I think uh, the most famous specimen of this is outside the ag building in SIU that I happen to be walking by one day on campus. And it's like, hey, that's a that's a black gum. That's growing in a highly compacted soil that students walk across daily <laughs> and, and trample down and it's doing fine. So that that was one of the convincing uh, planting sites for that uh, for me. So, yeah, great tree and becoming just more and more widely available, even at some of the, you know, larger garden centers and things I've seen uh, black gums in the last decade or so. So um, it's out there. It's it's a little easier to find than some of these. Uh, Kelly, this is your favorite from earlier. Uh, bald mm-hmm. And just, you know, can't say enough about this plant as far as its toughness and just tolerates everything from in nature. You know, it grows in standing water swamps of Southern Illinois. And, um, in the urban setting can handle compacted soils that are dry as a bone. So really, you know, handles, handles all conditions. And I, you know, I, I, I describe the fall color as bright orange. And I think it, this picture probably doesn't do it a lot of justice. This is from Urbana on a cloudy day. I wish it was sunny when I took that picture. Uh, It just really is almost an on fire, brilliant orange color in a lot of these and just great fall display. So And, you know, fall color varies from year to year. And, you know, uh, those of us with a column, I I know Ryan has a column and I have a column. We usually try to touch on this. You know, it's the temperature and the moisture levels that really contribute to how brilliant the fall color is. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when we have like consistently low night temperatures along with good moisture, you're going to have a more brilliant fall color. So, uh, I mean, we haven't had a ton of moisture this late in the fall. Um, so, I mean, I think the fall color is going to be good this year. I don't think it's going to be excellent. Um, what do you think, Ryan? You're the expert. Well, I mean, yeah, you've touched on probably two of the major factors. Another one in all of this, though, is sunlight. And if we have really cloudy, so sometimes you get a really rainy fall that has a lot of the moisture, but we have every day is cloudy in the month of October. And then we get, you know, it kind of ruins the fall color because those plants aren't photosynthesizing as much. So that's, you know, that the process of photosynthesis is what drives all these changes and it has to keep cranking late into the season like this. So um, yeah, it'll all be determined in the next couple of weeks of weather. So pretty soon here, we're all going to see what what we get. But uh, yeah, I agree with you, Kelly. I don't think it's shaping up. It's not one of those years where it's like, oh my gosh, we're having just this perfect, you know, once rain once a week going into it and moderate temperatures and things that are going to make fall 
color perfect, but... Um, but aren't we going to get some rain soon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're needing it in my neck of the woods. Yeah. We, got, we, we got some this past week, Candace and I, but uh, probably not as much as we would have liked. Yeah, yeah, we're good on the sunshine for now. We just need the cooler temperatures and moisture. Yeah. Well, and so uh, I guess we didn't talk about the bald cypress. Well, Kelly probably covered it earlier. It is a large tree, but we'll end with kind of our last kind of large shade tree. And just one of my favorites of all time is bur oak. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of our native oak species. If you look at the wildlife value, it is astronomical what this plant supports. And so there's a lot of research out there now and a lot of uh, data points you could look at that would tell you if you wanted to plant a woody plant that supports the most wildlife of anything, what could you plant? It's a lot of our oak species. So, you know, 456 caterpillar species are supported by this plant in the landscape. And that's just, to me, is a mind blowing number. Uh, some of the reasons why I like bur oak is that like bald cypress, it just handles a lot of those really tough conditions from flooding to droughts to, if, if you look at where it exists in the state of Illinois, um, in Southern Illinois, it's primarily confined to large floodplains. So areas along the Mississippi that, you know, receive like sometimes standing water and flooding where up here in central Illinois, it's confined to drier upland sites. So that just kind of shows its versatility in nature. And that translates into the urban setting. It's probably one of the, in my opinion, the toughest oak that you can plant in your yard. They're in a tough spot. So uh, really large acorns, I guess, is maybe one drawback for this plant. If it's over a sidewalk or something, you know, you could roll an ankle or that could be a, a safety issue. But Gosh, that's about the only thing I can say in the negative side towards this plant. Just one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Definitely one of my favorite favorites of the oaks. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to scroll back up to that apple tree question. We've got about 10 minutes or so left, so keep those questions coming. Anything tree-related or any type of gardening question, we can um, hit that today. Uh, let's see. Dorothy asked earlier, uh, my apple trees have some sort of rust and spraying didn't help. They are dwarf. One is Johnna Gold, one is Gala, and one, uh, another variety. Should I take them out? So, Dorothy, if, if you think you have a rust, and more than likely you have cedar apple rust on those, which is very common on, uh, on apple trees. And I guess my question would be for you, when you applied that um, spray, because any fungal infection and rust would be a fungal infection. Any chemical control needs to be uh, applied fairly early in the season before that fungus gets established, before the symptoms start showing up. So if you sprayed after you were already noticing the rust on the leaves, then you got to it a little bit late. So I wouldn't, to get rid of things, I wouldn't take things out. What I would do is I would, um, do that spray a little earlier in the season next year as more of a preventative. When you're when you're looking at fungal pathogens, you're spraying as more of a preventative versus a kind of cure after you've already had those symptoms. Would you guys agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, and I guess I would also wonder if maybe there's a little bit of apple apple scab mixed in there. Possible. Yeah. I thought that the Jana Gold variety had some res disease resistance bred into it, but I'd have to look that up. But um, they yeah, no either. do go to replant. That's what I really search for in, in fruit trees is like some, some type of disease resistance because, you know, for fire blight, for um, apple scab, for cedar apple rust, for there, there's a number of them, cedar apple rust, cedar quince rust, yeah. thorn rust. There's been a breeding that's kind of not eliminated the need to worry about those, but can really lessen the, the pressure your plant has from that. So... Um, you know, as far as making, when do you make the call of when to cut something down and when to keep it? Um, yeah, that's kind of a hard call to make. I think at this time of year, I usually tend to want to wait till spring and see what leaves out before I'd ever cut anything down because yeah. sometimes they can drop leaves a little early from stress uh, and next year will leaf out fully. But um, for me, it's kind of like once I lose about a third of that canopy, I really start to think this tree is not going to recover or come back. So if that kind of helps you make that decision next spring, maybe look to see if, if you've already lost a third, that's going to be really hard for that plant to come back from. But if you still think, you know, if you only lost a quarter or less and you can prune it out next spring, there still may be hope. And like Candace said, getting after it early would be good on any of those fungal leaves. 
questions. And it's, man, it really starts with, <laughs> hate to say it, but like for apple scab, like when flowers come out, you would start some of your spray applications. So it's, it's getting after it early. Yep. Yeah. And you can reach out to your local extension office. We have some um, spray schedules that we can share with you if you're really interested in, in keeping things really um, uh, disease free. There's a, a calendar essentially of a spray schedule for apples that you would follow kind of as the season goes along so that we can provide you too. I mean, I think an an another thing that I myself can admit to not being good at in the past is just the pruning that apple trees require. Mm -hmm. It's really every year. And I, you know, I, when I've skipped a year or two on any of my apple trees, it's like a mess to try and get back in line. And the reason why I mentioned that is that if you can prune it and open it up a little bit, you'll get a little more airflow and a little more natural control of those, those fungal pathogens. Yeah. It's kind of dual purpose. It, you know, it thins out the resources your, your plants putting into apples. So you're, you're going to have, if you prune it well, you're going to have like fewer apples, but greater in size and more healthy individual apples than if you have a lot of small ones on a lot of limbs. So a lot yeah. of it is to pruning and, um, it pruning gets to be kind of a tricky thing. It's a scary thing to cut a limb off of a branch off of a tree because you can't replace it. But um, just take some practice and getting used to. And there's uh, some good resources out there on the internet. Or talk to your local extension folks. We have a lot of great pruning resources and other things we can share. And in late winter, extension is going to be pushing that type of information. Apple pruning. I know I do an apple pruning workshop. And, an, and and usually I do an Apple integrated pest management workshop in the late winter because that is the best timing for that type of stuff. So, and, you know, we probably will even do a, a show on Apple pruning, um, you know, probably in January or February. So um, don't feel like you have to rush right out to learn how to prune an apple tree, but extension will start pushing that information out in late winter. Yep. Yeah, and that's a great point that uh, yeah, late winter is the time to prune, you know, like before the buds start to open up, but after, you know, the really cold part of winter's hit. So it's usually, you know, late January, February, March, I'm looking to do fruit tree pruning. And yeah, we'll definitely touch on that topic again, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's see. We've got a couple other questions here. A question here. I planted mums last year. Uh, they came back up this year. They budded nicely but have no blooms, what went wrong? Are the, do the buds look healthy? Because it, it could possibly just be that the buds haven't opened up yet and started to flower. Um, Kelly, what do you think? Um, you're the expert. I mean, that, that's the only, I mean, if, if, it, if it produced flower buds and the, the flower buds look healthy, um, I would say just give it some more time and they should open up for you. I can't, I, I typically the problem is getting them to bud. So if you already have the buds, I would, I would think you'd be, um, you should be pretty good. She said they look could, healthy. Could light requirements like sun versus shade, could maybe they need a little more sun? I don't know. I would, I didn't, to open the buds, I wouldn't think if you got the buds to form, I don't I think you're in the right spot. It's getting them to form that would be the the tricky. Yeah. Yeah. They might just be like Candace said, late, late bloomers. Yeah. yeah. Cuz not all moms bloom at the same time. Absolutely. Yep. And those think. ones that you buy in the garden center, we are forcing those. Yeah. Absolutely. We are we are creating artificial environment to get them to be in full bloom they're not supposed to be in bloom in you know late august early september so yeah uh, and you can always take a picture or something and send to uh you know you could put a picture on our facebook page candace yeah absolutely you could uh, if you're not in our extension horticulture group um Teresa, definitely if you have a picture post it in there and then we can kind of take a look and see how See how things look. And then you get more than us three. You right, get, yeah. You'll get a good crowdsourced team. answer too. <laughs> uh, the, and yeah, uh, sometimes the educators don't even have to answer the questions because there are <laughs> lots of really experienced gardeners on there too. Yeah, and we'll get a link to and we'll get a link to that for you in there our, our Facebook group. Okay, let's see a couple other questions here. 
Um, I just planted some small trees and bushes, uh, an American plum, service berry, and currants uh, this past weekend. How often and how much should they be watered through the fall? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. And how I usually try to describe that is in terms of uh, what the natural rainfall is for the week. So we're looking at, you know, one to two inches every one to two weeks. So if you want to be totally safe, it's like about an inch a week just to kind of round that off to nice round numbers. So this time of year, anytime we're not getting that about one inch of rain in a week, uh, you should go out and try and water. And, and I think it's for me, it's actually really easy to kind of track that because you don't want to water your tree like in little bits every day. You want to water it like once a week, like a rain rain event would happen, like that equals about an inch of rain. So once a week, water it nice and heavy. Um, so pick a day of the week, mark your calendar, and just you can look back at rainfall records to see what we got, or you can maybe you know from memory that we didn't get any rain and go ahead and, and give it plenty of water, you know, uh, Water and I, and I guess, were these newly planted, I think you said, Candace? Yeah, she said this past weekend. So, yeah, I mean, it's obviously super important to get water on those roots, right? The, uh, the Essentially, the pot that you planted in the ground or the root ball you planted in the ground, get that watered well. But don't uh, discount watering outside of that area because any of those roots that start to develop, you want to grow outside that uh, actual planting hole. So you want to keep it moist outside there. And... I always kind of view it right now as we go into winter, uh, keep watering all the way through leaf drop and you're gonna kind of build up a little bit of soil moisture that hopefully can last in the winter uh, because we're not, you know, it's not super hot where everything that all the moisture in the environment is evaporating quickly and everything as we hit fall. So, you know, you can count some of this watering as like a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a bank or a resource there as we go into winter to be in the soil and as things cool off and of course in winter we'll have Probably plenty of moisture and wet weather and things to keep your keep your plants going. So, so I have a cheat. One oh. of the things that I always roll my eyes at at people like Ryan, but I do the same thing. I go water one inch a week, and you're like, "What is one inch? What do you mean by one inch? Well, you know, one inch of rainfall. So, yeah. how do you replicate that? A really good rule of thumb is two gallons per inch of tree diameter. Hmm. What's a tree like that. diameter? That is how big your trunk is. Let's say you have a really little tree. You probably don't need a lot. You're probably going to do, you know, let's say you have two inch caliper. You're probably going to do, you know, only do four gallons. But if you have a bigger tree, you're going to do much more than that. So that tends to be what I tell people is to help them because, you know, I, I know a lot of time is we, we, we as horticulturists, we go water when it needs it. Uh, water, water one inch. So that is, um, so I can't remember where I got this resource from, but I, I think it was Purdue where it sort of broke it down into how much, how many gallons per tree diameter. And then I know Ryan's going to say this point, but you're going to take care of that tree for three years. You're not going to let it go into drought. And that will make it so much more successful in the long run. After the two to three years of really taking care of it, then you can step back and not do the supplemental watering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you should be able to. That should be your goal with a woody plant is to, for the first couple growing seasons, like Kelly said, two or three years, uh, really providing that water um, as it's needed and then have it, in, and you should get enough of a root system developed then that it's able to not be watered, you know, after, that. especially all these native plants we've talked about, they shouldn't need much care after that initial, you know, overcoming transplant shock. So yeah, great recommendations. Awesome. Okay, one final question to close us out today. Um, Andy asked, should I trim my hydrangeas to the ground in fall? They grow each year to three to four feet, then promptly flop, flop over after blooming giant white blooms. Could leaving the stalks over winter make the stalks more robust? So Andy, based on your description, it sounds like you have probably a smooth hydrangea, like an Annabelle uh, type hydrangea, I would imagine. And those do indeed bloom on new wood. So the, the new growth that's put on next year, that's where your flower buds 
are going to come from. So you can indeed trim those back this fall if you want to, and that may actually help you develop kind of a more shorter, more compact, sturdier um, bush a little bit. Would you guys concur with yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's always a problem with uh, with smooth hydrangeas that they flop over. And I mean, it's I, I really love that plant though. Don't let me know. Yeah much but i really love that plant i have them all across my front yard like kind of along the along the, along the front of our house uh but yeah it's always a problem that they flop over and i you know i've just kind of come to appreciate that about the plant too over the years i don't yeah. worry about, about mine i kind of just let them flop yeah and i know there are some uh like incredibles one that i can think of that are supposed to be improved kind of mm -hmm. sturdier stemmed varieties I've, I've i haven't done a comparison to see if that is actually the case, but um, yeah. Yeah, I have some just planted incredibles that go along with my Annabelles. That mm -hmm. Annabelles are mature and flopping over right now. My incredibles I just planted earlier this year. So hoping to have a side by side test of those two at my house. But there we go. Uh, but yeah, I think in my experience it, of observing mature incredibles, they do kind of stand up a little better. Uh, you know, another thing I've seen folks do is kind of interestingly in, insert like sticks or like really natural looking stakes into the center of the shrub. And if you can, mm -hmm. in the year, the, they kind of hang on those artificial supports. And that, that's just something that to me is like, man, that's another thing I've got to do beyond yeah. watering and all these things. I usually don't get to, to that step, but I've seen that really work well as kind of strategically placed little stakes that you almost don't even notice when you so you look closer at the shrub. So that's another way to. Yeah. That. Do yeah. You stake, do you stake yours, Candace? No, I don't. I you just, just prune. Let them go. Yep. And prune them. Yeah. For sure. And like I've said on most things, I use it as a cut flower. So I prune it a lot anyways, when I'm just cutting it to use as a cut flower. So mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I did do that a little bit inadvertently this year, just thinking, man, these things are flopping over and we could use some flowers on the kitchen table. And <laughs> don't even feel bad about cutting some off because they're waiting down that way. So, yeah. We got plenty, right? There's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, that was a great question to finish us out today. So thank you, everybody, for um, giving us your tree questions and all your gardening questions today. Hopefully you got some good suggestions of new trees or shrubs to try out in your landscape if you're looking for some new uh, options and some tips on how to manage those that are, that are already in there. Our next show is going to be October 29th, and that's going to be our special Halloween show. So it'll be spooky and creepy themed like we always do. So I think this will be our third Halloween show, I think, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. so come back on in two weeks and uh, I guess that'd be three weeks and join us then. And then, like I mentioned, we've got a link to that horticulture group in the chat box that you can check out if you have questions in between um, shows. And I know we've got a link posted to uh, Ryan's slides today too. So if you want to look back at any of those plants, uh, look back at that information, we'll have that. So thank you everybody for joining us today. We will see you back on October 29th. See ya. Thank you.